Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. This is all about flipping your classroom. Uh, and I have entitled it Flipping Your Classroom Without Flipping Out. Because when I did it for the, my first year, I did flip out. And there were a lot of negative consequences that I would like to share with you so you don't make the same mistakes that I did. Um, the, uh, if, this is the, uh, the URL if you want to ever get to this. You can uh, see the entire presentation. Um, and uh, the subtitle is Lessons Learned in a First Year of Frenetic Flipping. And if you talk to people who have flipped their class, really the whole point of flipping is so you don't have to be frenetic. A uh, quote I got from the flipping physics guy is the flipped class can be a lot more relaxed and fun. And I think everybody learns better when they are relaxed. And I really agree with that. Uh, the flipped classroom is, if you ask the uh, interwebs answer machine, this, it'll tell you this is what a flipped classroom is, a pedagogical model in which the typical lecture and homework elements of a course are reversed. Short video lectures are viewed by students at home before the class session, while in-class time is devoted to exercises, projects, or discussions. Truly, this is a way too restrictive definition. The folks that actually invented flipped learning aren't doing this anymore. So you've really got to be flexible in how you flip your classroom. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to use the term flipping to mean any use of video to make the lecture experience more efficient and effective for students and free up class time for more valuable pursuits. So why flip? Why do this? Uh, the question is not, as uh, John Bergman, one of the pioneers of flipping, said, uh, don't ask the question, where can I put a video into my lesson? The question is, what's the best use of my face-to-face -face class time? And anyone who has stood up and really by whatever material you had to deliver, been forced to stand up there for an hour and talk at the students and then quiz them about it, you know that they're just not getting it. And that's a whole hour to an hour and a half that you're spending that could be done with higher order tasks. Um, here's a little video that I want to show you here. Uh, this is a, a, one of the other flipped classroom leaders. I've been teaching math for the last five years. And this is why I flipped my classroom. And just as a pause here, one, one of the techniques we're going to use is uh, you can change the speed. And I think uh, I'm going to just speed it up a little bit here uh, so we can get through it quicker. And I think we'll still be able to get it. This is what my classroom used to look like. I was teaching to the middle group of the class, the students that could follow along with what we were doing and we were going through the content, while I had a group of higher level students not challenged bored with the information, ready to move forward. And I had a struggling group of students that were not receiving enough effective remediation. They didn't have the basic content they needed to be working on the content we were currently covering, or they needed more help in order to be successful. This led to a 90% use of class time being spent on delivery and review of content. 90% of the time I was at the front of the classroom lecturing to a group of students and I wasn't meeting all of their needs. 10% of class time was actually spent on application, which led to depending on students to do the application needed to be successful. They had to go home or outside of class and work on applying the concepts that I was giving out in class. This constant battle of not reaching the needs of all students and feeling the need to differentiate for all of my learners let the teacher, allows teachers to feel overwhelmed and ineffective because we see the need for differentiation, but there's just not enough time for effective differentiation. This called for a drastic change in how we teach. This is where flipping the classroom comes in. Now the students outside of class preload the content. They get the information they're going to need for class. They can pause, rewind, and rewatch the videos as many times as they need to. They can post questions online to their classmates or to the teacher. And it's a self-paced program where they can be remediated by going back and reviewing former topics, or they can work ahead when they've already mastered a concept and are ready to look forward. They get the content here before class so that when they come into class, my whole classroom has now shifted, where I'm at the center of the class, working between these differentiated groups, focused on different pieces of application. I can now work between each of these groups that are moving at their own pace. So that's just a basic overview. Uh, there are many, many other advantages. Uh, but uh, one thing that people ask about flipping, well, are, are we just trying to get rid of lecture? Is that the point of this? And another flip leader said this, let's agree on something. Teachers are going to lecture. It's going to happen. It's been embedded in the culture of human learning for thousands of years. This is not about getting rid of lecture. This is about making lecture more accessible, 
more effective and more efficient for students. There are many, many advantages of flipping. When I first encountered this, I was just blown away by how great this was because I was in a class like this. It was actually an online class, which is different than flipping. Flipping does require the, an in-school component, but my online class was on video. I could fast forward through all the boring parts that I already knew. I could reverse and rewatch all the parts I needed help on. To me, it was like uh, just uh, an epiphany. This is so great. Uh, it allows students to view lectures whenever and wherever they wish. They can pause, they can rewind, they can vary the playback speed. Uh, they can advance to the next lesson whenever they're ready. It's the same lecture for all, regardless of if there's a snow day, a sick day, late days. How many times have you, like after seventh hour, you're like, oh no, I just, I forgot that whole section. It won't happen if you flip your classroom. It allows easy sharing of lessons and collaboration between teachers. Video can take your lecture anywhere you want to go, to the roof of the school, the football field, the nature preserve, a Google Earth flyover of Apple Island, and without losing a minute of instruction. I used to take my kids out in the football field. That took 20 minutes just to get them out there. That no longer happens. It frees up class time, and this is the most important thing. It frees up class time for peer collaboration, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, one-on-four group tutoring, and active demonstrations, remediation, projects, discussions, labs, authentic assessment, student-created content, and more. This is what we want to be doing. This is the exciting part where the kids are being active. Uh, in fact, what I have here, uh, uh, one more thing, is that uh, it's scalable. Uh, you can just flip a single question. You don't need to be intimidated by this. You can flip just one lesson. One lesson per year is good. You could flip a whole unit if you want, or as I did, a semester. You don't have to make your own videos. The planet's greatest teachers have already created a huge, gigantic free archive of lecture material, which is easily shared with students. You may, however, choose to make your own videos. There's a couple reasons why. If there's one lecture that you only want to give one more time, this is a way to make that happen. Now, you all have a very unique perspective, and your students need it, and so does the world. Maybe we, in fact, we do want you to give your input. And your lesson, you have a lesson that's probably better than anybody else can do it. So that's what we want. Uh, if you have a lesson where you need that classroom time, you're always running out of time for that lab or that big group activity, you could flip your, the little introduction, even if it's only a 10 minute introduction, and then use all that class time for the activity that you want to do. All you need to flip is a smartphone, a whiteboard, and you, really, that's all that is necessary, as you saw from that video we just watched. And students do enjoy seeing you on the video. So there are reasons why you might want to do your own videos. So my flipping experience, subtitled, mistakes were made. <laughs> mistakes were made, yes, but perhaps, and we should, look at these as learning opportunities that were encountered. In science, there's so many examples of mistakes that were made. Oh, turned out to be the best thing ever. Just one example, discovery of penicillin. Uh, Fleming just left uh, all of his petri dishes a big mess, didn't clean them up. Big mistake, typically in a lab. He found that bacteria were not growing in one of the dishes where there was a mold growing too, penicillin. So we want to take advantage of all these learning opportunities. The way I flipped my classroom was first I did a one semester pilot in which I just use other videos. And here's a partial list of the video uh, choices that I gave my students. I posted this on my website, just all these links. There are so many physics lectures, really there's so many lectures in all topics that are available, and they could choose from whatever course they wanted to, from all these lectures from, for example, MIT, from Yale, from UC Berkeley, from uh, University of Missouri, just so many choices. They got to choose which lecture they best, lecture they best connected with. And then I just, I told them to watch the videos, and in class we did the homework in labs. And that's what we did. In my first year of flipping, some of the learning opportunities, I tried to flip the entire year with my own videos. In fact, I heard a, uh, I, I was you know, doing some research on this, and one of the actually more popular uh, mistakes, uh, the things I wish I would have known before I flipped my classroom videos, uh, the, uh, the teacher in that one said, don't try to flip your classroom in, in, in one year. Don't do it. And I said, ah, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to put my nose to the grindstone and get it over with. Not only was my nose ground down, my entire being was ground down. So by March, I was completely exhausted. And it really took away from the enjoyment of being there. And the kids could sense it. I could sense it. I was just exhausted. 
I will now repeat his recommendation. Don't flip your entire classroom in one year, maybe a couple, three years, or just flip a few lessons and see how it works for you. Uh, students were not required to show notes. This is a university course. I figured, you know, they can learn however they want. But as I found, that was a mistake. I let the students watch videos wherever they want. Maybe a mistake, maybe not. There's different, uh, different theories on that. And what I did was I went around helping students on all the homework with any questions they had. Now, when I came up to groups of students, I'd say, okay, any questions? Nope. You sure? Yep, we're good. You don't have any questions? Nope. That was really frustrating. I, now I had a, a several students, like maybe a third of the class, they were just constantly barraging me with questions. You know, what did this part of the lecture mean? Uh, what is, how do I do this problem? They were just really questioning intensely. Uh, I found that the students who continually asked questions did very well on my tests. Uh, what I found when I researched at the end of the year was that students, many students, probably about half or more, did not watch the videos. And they were so terrified because they didn't watch the videos that they, they felt like they couldn't ask questions. Because, well, I didn't watch the videos. It's, it's, I don't have any right to ask questions. So um, they, and in their final poll responses, they said they wanted to be forced to watch them. So here are some other challenges to flipping. And I'll just uh, end the possible solutions. No home internet. In, in my AP physics and honors physics classes, I also did a poll. Really, there were no students that did not have internet. There was one exception a couple of years ago. Uh, but in the, uh, the non-AP and non-honors classes, you may find that up to 10 or even 15 or 20 percent of students don't have internet at home. There are solutions. Uh, if you got a smartphone, uh, a smartphone and public Wi-Fi, that's all you need to watch a video. Public library is available for that. Uh, the student can work with a friend who does have internet. I had my student, my one student who did not have internet, I had her do that. You can put videos on a flash drive or even a DVD if, a, if the kid has a DVD player at home. That'll work. There's all kinds of new models developing. The asynchronous model, also called an internal flip. You can, if you're differentiating, you can have students who still don't get it re-watch or even watch for the first time videos in the classroom. If you want to watch this video in class, you can. However, as I'll talk about later, you have to put them in a separate area of the room or in the hallway. There's also a solution for no internet. EveryoneOn.org offers cheap internet and computers for students who are in free and reduced lunch. $10 a month for full internet access. And that link there can get you more information about that. So another flipping challenge, making sure students watch videos. This was one of my learning opportunities. It is tougher for the students because in the traditional classroom they can walk in and they can just sit there and be passive and they can even put their head down on the desk and the lecture will still happen. In this model, they have to actually take responsibility and sit down and do all the lectures. Uh, so I recommend a written letter to parent and student explaining this, the fact that they are going to have to take on this responsibility. John Bergman, Flipping Pioneer, all he said was, show me your notes, and then ask me an interesting question. That is a really very simple way to make sure the students have watched the video. And then you can ask them a question. Uh, what do you mean when you said right here, uh, the uh, uh, Thermal radiation, what does that mean? And the kid says, oh, I don't know. Then you say, maybe you need to take another look at that video, because copying will occur as it does. But you can, by talking with individual students and groups, you can figure out who has actually watched the video. Uh, you could have students answer questions on Google Classroom or Google Forms. I've set up a couple of Google Forms activities for you guys, so you can just try that out. Uh, you could have a, put a question in your video and have the students answer it as their entry ticket to class. Oh, you know the ticket? You're going to stay outside in the hall where we're all doing this really cool activity and you're going to watch those videos. You could have an easy open note quiz the, the next day, just like basically, you know, what topics were covered in this video. So they don't have to have mastered it, they just have to have seen it. Put any makeup watching videos in the hall or a distinct area while everyone else is doing that cool activity. Uh, and it's also important to not lecture in class when you find out all these kids have not watched the video. All right, I'm just going to lecture to you guys. What that does is that punishes the kids that did watch the, watch the video and it basically rewards the kids that didn't. And the message will be, don't watch the videos. He'll lecture anyway. So don't do that. You can send them out in the hall to watch the lecture. Now, another challenge is that students don't know how to watch. And I've crossed that out and put engage in videos. Uh, this is not like watching a movie. The kids are used to just watching YouTube videos and just going, ha, 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 that's funny. This is a different process. They need to engage the videos. You've got to spend time in class 
practicing how to do this, and we're going to actually get to practice this too, and they've got to interact in some way. Note-taking is a really good way, different methods of note-taking. Note-taking by hand. You might think taking notes on a computer is better. It is not. It's actually been shown by research that that slow process of trying to write out those notes way slower than the lectures going on forces you to do summaries and to uh, create summative knowledge. So writing notes by hand is key. You can also create required questions to be answered, asked in class, meaning like I'm going to require my students to have one question for every lecture. So I can see, I can tell by their questions if they're watching the videos or not. Like they, they did want to be forced and rewarded for asking questions uh, in my final poll. Uh, a good technique is called WISC, uh, invented by uh, a uh, Mrs. Kirsch, an uh, excellent uh, flipping leader. Uh, link is right there. But it's basically, you just watch the video, you summarize it, and then you ask a question about it. And we'll try that technique in our activity. Students are generally not in the right space to be viewing videos. Eye devices, radios, TVs, other tabs on browsers open, and other distractions really have to be put away for this. Great mnemonic Fitch from Kirsch is, means focused. You're just, all you got is your computer there or your screen. You're involved, you're taking notes, you're doing something, you're not just passively watching. Tabs closed, meaning everything else on your computer screen has to be down. Cell phone away, headphones in, especially if you're doing an internal flip. If everyone's playing their videos like without headphones, it can be a cacophony of different sounds. Students have to understand that the more engaged they are, the less time learning will take. You could watch a video 10 times and not get it if you're just watching it. If you watch it and take notes to it, you're going to get it a lot faster. In terms of engaging videos, there's a couple little symbols and things and terms we need to understand. YouTube icon, you got to understand what these mean. CC means closed captioning on. If there's a red underline, uh, it means that it's on. Uh, a, that little gear means you're going to adjust the image quality or the playback rate or toggle the closed captions. Theater mode and full screen are just different ways of looking at it. You can look at it at a wider screen or you can look at it uh, filling up your entire computer screen. Engaging videos, and we're going to try this in a minute, how you control the pace. These are things I didn't know before, but I found out that if you press the space bar, it'll pause your YouTube video. If you hold it, the video will start going in slow motion. If you do the right arrow key on your keyboard, that moves the video forward five seconds. Left arrow, backward five seconds. You can also use the L and J keys. L will be forward 10 seconds, J backward 10 seconds. And this gear, when you click on that, you can set the image resolution for slow connections. You can watch it at 144 pixels. And it'll also set the playback speed. Maybe you want to run it faster, and you can still understand it. Some kids may want to run it slower. And you can also get an add-on for Chrome that will allow you to do these videos frame by frame. What I'd like you to do, if you can either click on this if you're there, or if you don't have that up, you can just go to bit.ly slash all lowercase jb versus fray, just j-b-v-s-f-r-a-y. And what I want you to do is to try these things. You might want to, this is like one of my uh, music videos that I made for the students about Faraday's Law. Uh, also starring Nick Fralick. You might want to fast forward through the boring Faraday's Law part and get to the rap battle, uh, but go ahead and give that a try right now. Click on that. I want you to try these things right there uh, to see if you can get these to work. I'm going to come around and see how everyone's doing on this. I highly recommend you try this one too. Set the image resolution and playback speed to maybe faster or slower. See what works for you. And this was a revolution for me. It's like, wow, I can do this faster. Anybody need any help on this? <laughs> Big challenge for flipping is teacher intimidation. This, this can be scary. Uh, you got to create and or curate all these videos. Can take some time. Some teachers might say, how can I compete with all that slick produced stuff that's out there? Good news is you don't have to. Many, if not most, teachers have never made any kind of video for education. Raise your hand if you've ever made any kind of educational video. OK, so some people have. Uh, but these are intimidating things. There's solutions to these. You want to really start small. Try flipping one question. Just do that or one lesson. We're actually going to do that today. I've created this concept called an easy flip, where within uh, just a few minutes, you'll have flipped your own lesson. Use someone else's video. All the pros, they say this, use someone else's video. You don't have to use your own. 
You know, I, I really wanted to use my own, but you don't have to. If you do want to make your own, it can be easy. That uh, I'll show you the technique, a smartphone with a tripod, use a quiet, well-lit room, simple background, and then, or even you could just video yourself giving a lesson in class like I'm doing here. Here's another leader from the uh, flipping uh, community who pioneered this method called the one-take video. What I call one-take video is a content creation strategy that uses very simple tools like what I'm using to create this. I've got my cell phone on a tripod. It's one take because I hit record, I say what I need to say, I do what I need to do, I hit stop and the product is done. It's a rapid way of creating meaningful content that I can instantly review, reflect upon, and share. No software or editing is required. The one take video strategy is powerful because it keeps our focus on the information, the story, and the performance, not on the technology. And it's as simple as that. Student pushback, another challenge. Uh, this can be helped by preparing students and parents for the flipped class norms. The workload is going to be the same. It's going to be the same amount of work, but it will require increased student initiative and responsibility to watch these videos at home. You might even, as one uh, lecturer recommended, go back to the old way for a lesson. The, the kids will realize, wait, I can't stop him from lecturing. I can't rewind his lecture. And they may want to, uh, after being reminded of the bad old days, they will feel like you know flipping is so much better. Another problem, technology. And I actually added this slide after it took me 45 minutes to set all this stuff up. Typical flip classroom won't take that much, but if you're going to do like a massive setup or try to video yourself lecturing, uh, it may take a little bit of time. Solutions, make sure you research on what is needed, practice, and a technology dry run. Start early would be another one I'd add in there. Best practices, start small, as we already mentioned. Collaborate with other teachers flipping. Maybe you have a, a partner teacher you want to work with here at the school. If not, there's people you can work with teachers all over the web. The technology is totally present where you can have a live lecture with two people at the same time or in different parts of the country. Uh, use other teachers' videos. I've got a bunch of choices for that. Don't increase the student workload. That's not what this is about. This is about using face-to-face -face class time to do what you really want to do. Don't forget to do the homework in class. That's what the flip is. Uh, I call it a work day in AP Physics. Don't lecture in class to make up for students not watching videos. Be super flexible with these videos. Any way that you can make lectures more accessible, efficient, and effective, or any way you can use video to free up class time for this fun stuff, that to me is a successful flip. The length of your videos is the best practice. It's been said you want the grade level times one or one and a half minutes. For example, a 10th grader could be from 10 to 15 minutes, but truly, Less than five minutes is best. That's what these kids are used to, is a less than five minute video. If you can keep it under five minutes, awesome. If you can't, try to shoot for 10 minutes or so. I've had several, if not many, 15 minute sections of AP Physics. It's some pretty uh, complicated stuff, but uh, that's kind of a good rule of thumb. One to one and a half minutes per grade level. For the best tech tools, I've got more slides with live links you can use. Not enough time to talk about all the technology available. There's a great uh, source on flipclass.com, which is this. You can click on those and find out all kinds of choices. And uh, how to find pre-made videos. Again, you can just click on the links of this presentation. I took my top three there that you could uh, click on those, and they give you bunches of lists of where you can get videos. Best how to flip primers. Again, just take this uh, presentation, click on those, and if you want, like, a uh, introductory course on flipping your classroom. These were my favorites that I found. And some of them are five minute videos, some of them are an hour video, but these are some of the, the top how to flip primers that I found online. Again, I've just uh, put them all together for you in one page so you can check them out very easily. Now, I'm no expert. I've only flipped for one year. I didn't invent this, but I, you know, what I really wanted when I was starting to flip was, somebody just tell me what to do. There's too many choices, so I'm gonna tell you what to do. Now, this is just what I like. So, you, you know, really best practice, research your own, find out what you like. But if you're looking for that, what do I do? Here is what I did. The video starts YouTube. YouTube, come on, everyone does YouTube. It's the best, it's the most popular. All the kids know how to use it. There's so many advantages to it. It's free. Most everyone's familiar with it. So many other educators are on there, including Khan Academy, love Khan Academy. Uh, automatic captioning. 
You make a video, it will caption it for those who are hard of hearing automatically. How cool is that? Image quality is adjustable for slow connections. Students can subscribe to your channel so they'll be notified when you upload another video. You can easily share and embed videos in your web page uh, or your Google Classroom. You can organize videos and playlists. You can uh, uh, have multiple channels. Maybe you want to have a different YouTube channel for chemistry and physics. Even YouTube even has a rudimentary editor for videos. It's very easy integration with Google Sites and Google Classroom. Almost all, I, I think all screencasting software uploads to it uh, natively. In other words, you just say upload to YouTube, click it once, and it does the whole thing for you. You can play videos at different speeds. So I think YouTube is a fantastic choice. For screencast recording, what I'm using today, and I'm actually recording you guys with this, is Camtasia for Mac. It's 99 bucks. It will record an image of me, and it will all, all record an image of the screen at the same time. The, the Windows version is much more expensive, although it does have some more functionality. Free options, there are, and we'll play with some of these free options today. Screencast-O-Matic works on Mac and Windows. Screencastify works for Chromebook. And uh, you can, uh, I've given you links also right on those, or when we get to the activity, you can try those out if you'd like to. To write on the board, I like writing on PDF files so I can easily store my, you know, the lecture notes that I've produced on the screen. Mac, Curio is good for this. Skitch requires Evernote Premium. If you've already got Evernote Premium, you could use Skitch. I like it, but I didn't want to get Evernote Premium. Adobe Acrobat, Acrobat Pro, very expensive, but you can also write on PDF files. Windows, I don't have a whole lot of experience with, but uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro does it. Camtasia Studio also uh, the, the one reason that the uh, Windows version is more expensive is you can actually write on the screen just using the, uh, the editing and recording software Camtasia. So that's cool. I've got a Wacom tablet right over here. Uh, you can get a big range of these. You can get these for 100 bucks or less. This one costs 1000 uh, bucks. My wife is an artist, and uh, I decided we decided that uh, she wanted to get one of these too, but she wanted the super fancy one, so we split it. And it was, uh, it's turned out to be really, really nice, but... For 100 bucks, you can really do the same thing. Uh, it just won't have a screen that shows you what you're writing on. You'll just write on the pad, and you'll look at your computer screen and see what you're writing. It takes a little bit of practice, but after a few minutes, you can get it pretty easily. So $100 if you want to write on a tablet. Uh, also, I believe that the uh, iPad will work for that, too, if you get a stylus for that. Now, in terms of whiteboard writing, this was part of my research. I asked students, for lectures on YouTube, which do you generally prefer? 55 students responded. And 78 preferred white writing on black, like this example right here. 22% preferred the black on white, but we can see that just with this, and I didn't want to introduce any colors or anything like that, but just the most of the students prefer the white on black. I think it's a little bit easier on the eyes, uh, but you do have students that prefer black on white, so be aware that everyone has different needs and different preferences here. Looks like the, the white writing on black does win on a dark background. So here we finally get to the activities. This is the fun part. These are levels of flipping that we're going to try today. And you can try these on your own. The great part of this flip, and this is where the actual flipped example starts, you can do this at home. You don't need me to be here. I will go around helping people, and that's what the, the use of the teacher for a flipped classroom is. Uh, so the first lesson is, and this is the one that I'd like everyone to try. It's experiencing a flipped lesson. And the lesson happens to be about how to increase student engagement on video. So it's something that if you're going to flip your classroom, you should check out anyway. So you're going to be a student here, and you're going to experience this flipped classroom. <laughs> and it also uh, will show you how Google Forms can be used to assess engagement. Now, I don't use Google Forms, but I just wanted to try it. So I just tried it for this lesson here. Maybe you, when you see what Google Forms can do, maybe you'll say, wow, this is amazing. It can grade all the quizzes for you. It can tell you instantly what time the students turn it in. It is an amazing tool, uh, and it's something you should really check out, but it ain't for everybody. Uh, this will allow you to check that out. So I would like everyone to, when you're ready, to click on that first one and uh, just go ahead and try that. The second one is creating a YouTube channel. There is a, a video that shows you how to do that, and I've made the video so fast that you will have to use your pause key, your rewind key, and your fast forward key to get that. So it's purposely made it a very fast rate that nobody can follow so you can practice using your controls. Uh, and then you're also going to create and share YouTube playlists in that one. The third lesson is to embed a video in a Google Form quiz. Maybe you want to like jump ahead and actually try this. Uh, embed a video and then you can actually, for extra credit, you can have Fluberoo, a uh, uh, Google Forms add-on, 
grade it for you and send you and the students all the results. Or maybe you just want to get going right now and create your own screencast. If that's you, then we're going to want to take you to a quiet area, maybe out in the hall. You can click on the left one for Windows and Mac, click on the right one for Chrome, Chromebook, and you are good to go. So go ahead and try, if, if, we, if you can, if you can just try this first one, because I did want to show you how uh, I will, this will automatically grade your uh, results. And there's also, using Google Forms, you'll notice that some of the questions give you feedback. They'll say, nope, your answer is wrong. Think about this. You can also give instant feedback on Google Forms. Go ahead and try whichever ones of these uh, appeal to you, and maybe you want to try them all. So uh, any questions at this point before we start going into the actual flip here? Uh, I've uh, played with Google Classroom very, very small amount. Uh, one uh, tip on that is if you want to embed a Google Form in your Google Classroom, you actually have to use the link. There's not a native way of uh, embedding it, but you have to use the link. Uh, I like Google Forms just because uh, my probably one of my least favorite things is grading homework. Even checking it in is something that, you know, a computer could do this. So I, I actually use Web, WebAssign, which is a way more flexible than Google Forms. Uh, and this is really the only experience I've had with Google Forms is doing this. But you'll see kind of the things that it can do. Um, Google Classroom, I know you can ask questions, but then you've got to read all the questions and read all the answers. and So something to check out, at least. Uh, if you're not into Google Forms, that's fine. Just like I said, just having them show you the notes is another way to ensure the students are engaging. Any other questions before we get going on this? I will be walking around trying to help folks. Yes. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yes, you can make a YouTube. The question was, can your YouTube channel have videos from other people? The answer is absolutely yes. In just the last few minutes, uh, I thought it might be valuable to actually show you the results of my research. And I was warned about all these things, and I ignored the warnings, and you'll see what happened. Uh, really, I was just trying to figure out what was going on, why my students weren't asking questions, what, you know, what is it about this flipped classroom that uh, was causing difficulty. And uh, really, this question, I think, said a lot. The end of the year, I asked this, uh, the first year flip students, if given these choices for a class similar to this one, which would you choose and why? And sure enough, just like I was warned, most kids, 62% of them said, no, I want to go back to live lecture. You know, the 38% that loved it just loved the heck out of the, the video lectures at home. Now, the, the true answer to this question, though, came in the why do you feel that? And uh, before I go into that, though, uh, what I did was I did a uh, statistical comparison between the students that said, yes, I would prefer video, and the students said, no, I prefer live lectures to see what their average quiz scores were. And it's really no surprise that the kids that like the videos, they did better, statistically significantly better, on quizzes. And that's a correlation. So, uh, but it does to show you that, yeah, the kids that like videos respond well to videos. But the, the real answer to my question, and this is all small because this is all the comments the students uh, gave me about why they preferred their preference. And what I found is that for the kids that preferred live lectures, there were three categories of answers that kept coming up. They were, they were related to either not watching the videos. The kids said, hey, I just didn't, wasn't able to find time to watch the videos, so that's why they didn't like it. Uh, ease and emotions of learning. Uh, some of the kids responded that, I feel like I learn better when there's a real person talking to me or that their emotions weren't as uh, positive towards it, and that's what caused their problems watching the videos. Uh, and then the other one was the ability or motivation to ask questions, which to me said, wait a second, all I ever did, all class was say, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? And so, and the kids said, well, I couldn't ans ask questions. So to me, that said there was something else going on. It, was, it became apparent that the kids and a couple said, I really want to be forced to watch the videos. For example, uh, I wasn't as motivated as I should have been to watch the videos at home. And you can read that as, I didn't watch the videos at home. <laughs> so this is why this year I'm going to require it and actually have a quiz or show me your notes. Because once they start watching the videos, then they will have questions. And that is going to be another thing I'm going to do is require uh, a question per lecture at least. The kids that preferred the video lectures, 
the three uh, categories that they fell into was because they can rewind and change the speed. Uh, they like doing the homework in class. They prefer having someone there helping them. Or the whole flexibility of the flip model, they can watch it while they're waiting for their, they're, they're at uh, rehearsal for the play. They're sitting there for half the time waiting for their, you know, their time on stage to come up. They're watching a video with their iPhone. So those are the three things that the kids that liked it preferred. In, in final remarks, uh, I think this is the one thing that I would very much want to stress. Uh, again, one of the pioneers, Aaron Sams, of Flip Classrooms. Uh, here's a quote from this video right here. You'll notice that these, meaning the videos, are not perfect by any means. We're making mistakes. We scribble stuff out. We got some stuff wrong in some of them. We try to go back and fix that. Otherwise, we task our students with finding the mistake in the video. These are not high production professional. Our rule of thumb is, do I need it perfect or do I need it Tuesday? And usually Tuesday wins. So for me, I think actually, in the end, it was a good idea for me to try to do it in one year because I got most of it done. And I tend to really want to make my lectures nice. And man, did I notice how many mistakes I make in lecture? Usually the students are there to say, no, that's not it. It's this. Like, oh, yeah, you're right. But when I was alone doing these videos, there was no one there to correct me. So I would find them when I watched it. I really learned a lot about my lecturing style and how much I say um, er, I say that a lot. Uh, so for me, just having it due on Tuesday helped me get it done. Yes, I'm a perfectionist. Don't do what I did. You will make yourself miserable. Try to flip a lesson. If you can do that, I feel like you're a success. Uh, you are a success no matter what you do. So uh, thanks for coming to this. And uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions about any of these. And also feel free to go ahead and try any of those activities so you can see if you want any more instruction on like flipping or technology or Google Forms, I'd be happy to help anybody at any time. Thanks again for coming in. <laughs> Thank you.